Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Arian, and he's going to tell us his near-death experience. Hi, Arian. Hey, Peggy. How are you? Good. Peggy, I just first of all want to say thank you all the way from South Africa. Um, it's amazing for me that um, somebody that's doing such an incredible show regarding spirituality um, would give me the honor all the way from South Africa, Johannesburg, South Africa, to be able to share part of my story with you. So I thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. So would you like me to jump in or would yes. you? Okay, yes. great. Perfect. So my near-death experience is a little different to some of the guests that you've had on your show. And in my situation, um, I had an encounter that led up to me almost dying um, and through the process of dying realizing that the encounter was actually real and there were a set of circumstances that unfolded that led me to believe that so what happened was i um, had gone on a two-week uh, drug binge um, and i was desperately trying to kill myself i had gotten to the point where i just couldn't make sense of this world and this life and um, was paying people to inject me with, um, with amphetamines and stuff like that. And I remember it went on for two weeks and it was the Saturday night and I went into the bathroom to go and consume more of the drugs. And all of a sudden there was this apparition, this entity, this being that kind of had the form of a human being um, that was a flame, that was a light, and um, and it was quite scary for me because in the beginning I thought, was I hallucinating on the drugs or what was actually going on here? And what was fascinating for me was that um, at the time I had just put on this mix on this um, app that I had on my phone called Mixcloud, and after two weeks, I'd run out of words to search, like happy house, make me smile, dance house, whatever. And so I had just typed in joyful house and one mix, there's only one mix on Mixcloud um, called joyful house. And this apparition, this visual thing that I was seeing started drawing my attention to the lyrics within each track of this mix, which is fascinating because up until that point, I wasn't somebody who ever really paid attention to the lyrics of music. I'm a dancer, so the, the, the bigger the bass, the better. And uh, so every single track was an exact, when I say exact, I mean word for word sentence that I had been running through my mind in this two week, trying to find the reason or the motivation to actually kill myself, which absolutely blew me, blew me away. and. Uh, during this process of this entity, I'm going to call it God um, for the sake of understanding. You know, there's a, a lot of theological arguments that one could have, but for the ease of understanding, I'm going to call it God. I experienced it as such, so I will call it God. And uh, and there was a particular track, and uh, this entity said to me, God said to me, "You've been called. Are you going to take the call?" And I know that I've been called my entire life. And the reason why I say that is I was born with a spiritual gifting, um, a prophetic gifting. Um, the very first prophetic gifting I ever had, I was three years old. I remember seeing my dad's youngest brother drown in the ocean. And two weeks later, he drowned in the ocean. And there have been many random scenes into the spiritual world that have happened throughout my life. Um, and anyway, so this entity said to me, are you going to take the call? And I was like, yes. And the entity said to me that, or God said to me that, um, you've got one of two choices now. You're either going to take the rest of the drugs and flush them down the toilet, and then we start from there, or you continue consuming the drugs and then you deal with the consequences. So being me and on this mission to try and commit suicide, I continue taking the drugs. At the end of the track, of this mix, Joyful House, a mixed cloud. Um, Michael and Michael Jackson song came on, which is one of my favorite dance songs, which is Billie Jean. And 
there I was in the state, and as I was taking the drugs, dancing to Billy Jean, I could literally feel my body starting to die. I could feel it shutting down. And so I got very scared because I'd never experienced anything like that before. And so I couldn't type a message to anybody for help. So all I could do was take a picture of the hotel card and just send to wherever my finger went. And, uh, and then eventually passed out. And all I can remember is the next morning is this voice screaming at me and, and pulling me off the bed. And as I started come to consciousness, it was my partner. And uh, he said to me that had he not arrived exactly at the time that he did, I would have drowned in my own vomit. He literally caught me drowning. And uh, so what happened after that is I was completely devastated because the money that I'd used on this, this two-week drug binge was money that I was um, using, was meant to use for a major South African hairdressing competition. And so I went to my pastor, Pastor Andy, who runs a church in Hingham in the UK now, and I said to him, I'm devastated because I wanted to do this. This is the ex spiritual experience I had. And one of the tracks in the song was Catch a Falling Dream. And this was my dream to win this competition. What do I do? And he said to me, well, you've only got one choice because you've blown the money. You've got to now depend on God to find a way if this is what you really want to do. And uh, I entered and got into the finals. And one night, in the middle of the night, God woke me up. And it was like when you flash a, a flash drive into a computer. And it was like this download of pictures and hairstyles and garments and music and design and choreography. And I did it. I ended up winning the competition. And that was the moment that I could definitely say that this experience that I had wasn't a hallucination, but was an actual real experience because two months after this experience of catch a falling dream, I win the dream that I had actually wanted to win. So, yes. Awesome. Um, sometimes when you get real animated, um, your voice gets a little lower. Okay. So I'll, I'll keep go. the I'll right there. That, that was good and loud when you went forward a little bit. Okay, perfect. I'll do that. But it's been good otherwise. It's good. Okay, thank you. And so, um, what has happened since that experience, I um, have written a book called Bedroom Called Rainbow. Um, it's available on Amazon. And it's interesting because that experience, spiritual experience and me then winning this care competition, which confirmed this spiritual experience for me, um, I decided to write a book, which I knew 15 years ago that I should write. Um, but I didn't think that anybody would actually be interested in reading a book about a hairdresser, drug addict, struggling, trying to overcome multiple issues. And so wrote the book. And this book is the story of my life growing up in apartheid South Africa with a, a very violent alcoholic father who literally tried to murder me twice, um, being sexually abused from the age of four to 13, um, and that's distorting my view both on sex and identity and masculinity, which drove me into the LGBT community and desperately trying to find a father figure, a rescuer to love me that I could have the excuse of loving myself, which then got me into drug abuse, full bone addiction, and ended up in rehab the first time. Um, at the age of 30. And the, the, my whole conversion or salvation story is pretty radical in itself. The rehab, which was in uh, Boxburg in South Africa, um, they, there was a Christian organization called the Christian Motorcycle Organization, and they came and did an outreach at the rehab. And uh, and they handed out this little flyer, and on the flyer was the story of this motorbiker who kept looking in his rearview mirror, eventually driving off a cliff and killing himself. And it really spoke to me because at the time I was dealing drugs, and so I was quite used to looking at 
my rear view mirror the whole time. And so sheepishly at the end, I went up to the guy and I said to him, do you think God would accept a drug addict homosexual like myself? And he said, God accepts anyone who wants to turn and repent. And so I prayed the salvation prayer. And that night or within the one, one or two days of that salvation prayer, I had a tremendously mind-blowing experience where I woke up and I was aware that I was having a conversation with something in the room that wasn't in the room, but I knew it was gone. And what was fascinating about that is that I didn't wake up and sit up. I woke up already sitting up, already in a conversation with something that wasn't there, but it was there. And again, I'm going to call it God. I experienced it as God. And uh, God said to me, you need to read Romans 1. And that was pretty bizarre because I hadn't owned the Bible since I, or touched the Bible since I was about 12 or 13 years old. And I didn't even know that Romans was a book in the Bible, <laughs> but somehow I knew. And so I didn't own a Bible. I decided to go to the nursing station in the rehab and ask them if they have a Bible. And lo and behold, they have a Bible. And the Bible didn't even have a cover. Half the books were torn out of the thing, but it had Romans 1. And uh, Romans 1 is quite a hectic chapter if nobody's ever read it because it really goes into in depth um, looks at what God considers dysfunctional human behavior and the consequences of when we allow ourselves to go down that, tra- that um, journey of dysfunction. But God pointed out verse 32, Romans 1 verse 32 to me, which says that worst of all, that people who con- behave this way condone and coerce others to do the same. And in that moment, it was like there was a movie reel that flashed before my eyes of my life. And I saw every time that I was at a bar trying to coerce people to have another shooter, offering people drugs, trying to sexually seduce people, sending the nudie pics on the dating apps, all of this kind of thing. And I realized that I was guilty of the sin of coercion. And I realized in that moment that God was saying to me that he didn't want me to be living the lifestyle that I was living. That was 18 years ago, and I've been uh, walking out my journey as a Christian um, with much argument. Um, In Christian circles in South Africa and Johannesburg, I'm known as a little bit of a professional prodigal son (laughs) because I'm in church and out of church, and you can understand that And when one comes from a homosexual background and you experience Jesus and you come to realize that Jesus is actually real, obviously that's controversial. And so I've had a difficult walk as a Christian because you have Christians who are projecting their own prejudices around homosexuality. You've got the the LGBT community who projects their disdain of Christians. And so it's this to and fro the whole time. And so I write about all of that in my book. Um, And I've written it very honestly. It's not a nice Christian book. And where there was bad language as it was used, I wrote about it. I used the asterisks and, and asterisks and stuff like that to be a little bit respectful. But I didn't want to write a a story of a guy discovering that Jesus is real and pretending that I'm more holy than I was back then, you know. So it's 100% authentic. It's very honest. It's very heartbreaking in some places. But the, the part that I really love about my own book, which people are giving me feedback on, is, is that everybody comes to the point of realizing that it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been in your past, is that if we genuinely try to walk out a relationship with God is that he finds a way to teach us and bring us out of the darkness into the light. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I mean, because that's so needed. Yes. Right yes. now. So what uh, has happened? I, yes. Sorry. Good. No, go ahead. So what, what has transpired because of my book, um, Bedroom Called Rainbow, 
is um, there's an international group of um, former LGBT identified people like myself who've walked away from um, sexual identity um, and sexual orientation to follow Jesus. And so my book has opened me up to this international network of hundreds of thousands of L former LGBT people who've realized that how toxic that lifestyle is and how amazingly real and beautiful Jesus is. And so I'm busy working on a second book, which is in a way, it's a kind of international co-authoring. So it's a self-help, I hate the word self-help, it's a self-evaluation manual where I'm using the years of therapy, some of my experiences, um, some academics that I've learned along the way. And what I've done is that every chapter of each book is, of this book, um, I'm putting questions out to this international network of people who are then answering the questions and I'm including their testimonies in throughout the book. And I'm hoping that it will be able to teach um, the Christian community who are prejudicial against um, former L or LGBT people or pastors or other LGBT people to be able to work through this manual and be able to start to unpick some of the misconceptions about sexual orientation that they've come to believe. Um, and so what prompted this, actually, there was a, a 15 year genetic study, which was released in August 2019. Um, it was run by an organization called 23andMe. And so they took, tested the DNA of lesbian girls, gay boys, um, hetero men and hetero girls to see if they could trace a homosexual gene. The conclusion of that study is, is that there is no gay gene. There is no way of, of determining somebody's sexual orientation through genetics. What they also found is that there are four epi markers that could correlate. Now, it's very important to stress the language um, which they use with the word could correlate um, because the LGBT community loves to say that those epi markers are evidence of um, the gay gene. It's a complete lie because the language is could correlate. However, what's important is that those four epi markers also relate to other um, things, like the one relates to smell, the one relates to balding, the one relates to bipolar manic depressant disorder, and the other one to predatorial hypersexual disorder. Both of the, of the, the last two are highly prevalent in the LGBT community. Um, to give you an example of a stat of such a thing, is that the rape statistic in the um, hetero community is roughly sitting at 35% uh, globally. In the LGBT community, it is 40, uh, 44 to 45%. Um, and, and what am I saying? 45 to 50%. On top of which, um, studies show that um, LGBT people remain highly sexually promiscuous much through to their older age, whereas heterosexual community tends to drop off. So there's this high prevalence of um, dysfunctional sexual behavior within the LGBT community. Um, however, what the, that study, that 15 year genetic study concluded by 23andMe, um, is that the epi markers are too small to be conclusive evidence as um, a gay gene. On top of which, the overall um, conclusion was is that um, same-sex attraction and um, LGBT identity is all learned behavior, it's all socialized behavior. And if one goes and looks at the Journal of Gay and Lesbian Studies, um, there's, a, there's a phenomenon which is called imprinted arousal patterns. And that stems from um, children who have been sexualized early in childhood or sexually abused. So what imprinted, imprinted arousal patterns are is that our brain, our neural pathway, um, stores the data of that traumatizing sexual experience. And unless we go deal with it and unpick it and heal from it, 
our brain then uses that data to recreate our future sexual experience. Now, why that's important and why the Journal of Gay and Lesbian Studies wrote and did studies on this is, is that um, the stats of um, sexual trauma within the LGBT community um, is up to 93% of all LGBT um, people have been sexually abused in early childhood, which means that 90, up to 93% of people who identify as LGBTQ are not actually LGBTQ. They're simply reliving a traumatized sexual orientation based in trauma, thinking that it's their sexual orientation. Sorry about that. It's the, the wild type. <laughs> and so um, there's another phenomenon which um, which is quite fascinating is something called truth by repetition. It's we've all experienced truth by repetition. It's the way we learn to talk, read, write, do certain tasks. That's truth by repetition. Now there's a problem with truth by repetition is, is that if one learns a lie by truth of by repetition, the lie sounds like truth because it's familiar. And only if one goes and challenges what you think is true, with the narratives that you believed are true, and then measure them against academic fact and known facts, can one then start to determine whether your ideas, your ideologies, your orientation is based in truth. So what happens in the LGBT community, when one talks about these things, obviously their self-defenses go up, and the reason for that being is, is that because they believe this trauma, sexual trauma as their sexual identity for so long, that it's become familiar. And so because it's become familiar, it's interpreted as this is who I am. This is my truth. This is truth. Even though in the face of academics, it is proven to not be true. And so what I'm hoping is, is that with this new self-evaluation um, manual that's written by gay people for gay or LGBT people, that it will be received by the community so that they can start to unpick some of their own wounds. So, yes. Okay. I'm curious, how are you treated by the other, your ordained minister now, correct? Yes, correct. How, how are you treated? Are you treated? By the, by the LGBT community? No, by the other ministers that aren't. Oh, um, so um, the, the reality is, is that um, I have to work doubly as hard to prove that I'm trustworthy um, and to prove that, um, that I know and worship the same Jesus as they do, obviously, um, which I don't mind. Um, it keeps me accountable. Um, and I like to rise to the challenge. Um, but what I have been doing for a very, very long time is on social media. It's, social media is more of my social political commentary more than anything else. I've been sharing all the information that I've been learning, educating people as I go along. Um, and obviously, there is going to still be some people who think that ho homosexual sin is worse than other sin you know and that's their um sin preferential bias you know um, and that's something that they have to deal with but as god i suppose softens hearts within within the hetero community i think more and more people are starting to realize that god will use absolutely anybody who makes their lives available to him um but yes um for the most part, I'm received lovingly, but obviously for some, they find it weird. And that's their business. <laughs> it sounds like we should be looking at that um, the gay community as troubled people that were sexually abused as children that <laughs> haven't come to terms yes. with it instead yes. of um, respecting their rights, I don't want to say yes. disrespect their rights, but to, to yes. see that they're not well. And yes. instead of seeing this as something we should all um, accept and mm -hmm. embrace, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and respect their choices and allow our children to see that as a choice, that that is not correct, that we should see this as, no, this is a child, say you, from 4 to 12, 14 years old, sexually abused. This is something that's altered your brain, that's given you behaviors that has taken you a lifetime to understand the consequences of and that I'm assuming is partially why led to your suicidal ideation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that, that we should not be honoring and respecting, but have an empathy Mm. that this is a person that's unwell. Yes. Yes. And, and that, um, that we need to watch our children more closely. Absolutely. Absolutely. To give you two, two, two proofs of your statement, and I fully agree with you, um, is um, LGBT sexual orientation was, was identified as identity dysphoria up until the 1970s. And then there was obviously activism that took place and you know, the LGBT were offended by that word. But the reality is, is that in the um, medicine and psychology, that is actually its legitimate name, is identity dysphoria. It's a mental health issue. And what's fascinating is, is that the LGBT community suffers up to um, 63% um, more mental health issues than the hetero community. Those are proven stats, and you can go and find them anywhere. Um, 33% um, or 33% more likely to commit suicide than the than the hetero community. And I can tell you that although the LGBT community loves to blame shift and go, oh, it's because we were discriminated or bullied, the reality is, is that every single LGBT person, if they are truly honest, will tell you that there's a part inside of them that they just know that they're not comfortable with this. Now, to add fire to, or coal to the fire, is um, the fact that the LGBT community is pushing to have um, sexual orientation introduced within schools goes to prove this cycle of abuse. Now, what's fascinating is this, is that You've got a bunch of people, according to the Gay and Lesbian uh, Studies Journal, up to 93% that have suffered sexual abuse in early childhood, who most likely haven't done any therapy to heal, and are using this traumatized sexual identity to now push a sexual identity onto other children. So they're just literally in the cycle of abuse. I have said it many times on social media and the LGBT community hates my guts for saying it. As far as I'm concerned as a person who lived that lifestyle, all LGBT human rights need to be retracted. I'm not saying to put them in jail, nothing like that, not forced medication, nothing. But no marriage, no influence over children at school, no influence of trying to uh, reorientate businesses. And the entire community needs to be received with empathy to first go for therapy, to deal with the trauma, and once they're healed, then the the issue of um, equal rights and all of that kind of stuff can be readdressed because when you're dealing with mentally healthy people versus people who are forcing trauma identity onto the world, especially considering that genetics has now proven no person is actually born LGBTQ. And it seems to me like, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it seems like um, people that are homosexual, I mean, do they? Do you think they tend to have more drug addiction, alcoholism, suicidal Absolutely. ideation? Absolutely. So um, 33% of the stats are 33% more likely to commit suicide. And trans people, 85% more likely to commit suicide, even after trans surgery. Um, um, 85% of the global LGBT community are addicted to substance abuse, whether it be alcohol, uh, prescription medication, um, illegal uh, drugs. Um, um, over 90% experience same partner violence. Um, 
like I said, is um, 45 to 50% experience rate. Now, one of the um, um, LGBT organizations that deal with rape in the gay community specifically, um, there was an article that they shared, sharing some of the, the gay stats and why it's so prevalent within the gay community. And one of the quotes out of that particular article from a gay man who had been raped, an American guy who had been raped in Germany, um, and his quote was, that is just what happened. That the mindset has gotten to the point in the LGBT community where it's expected that one is going to experience rape somewhere along the line. I think if they would also look into the studies of priests that have raped the boys Absolutely. and those men, what they have to say now, how that altered their life. Absolutely. And, and there, Absolutely. there's not healthy yes. to, well, to be see, raped well, as a child. And, to, and when you grow up, you're not healthy because Absolutely. you have that deep seated problem. So to give you know, you I, idea, I was abused, you yeah. know, and I know really? it never, I'm 61. It never leaves you. It affects Are you. Are you 61? Mm -hmm. I can't believe it. Yeah. I'm a great grandma. I, I can't, cannot believe that you're 61. Yep. You look my age. You look better than me. How old are you? I'm 48. You yeah. look amazing. Thank you. So, and how long did it take you to heal from your sexual trauma? It's still ongoing. You know, yes. things, I watch a movie and all of a yes. sudden I pause it and I'm crying, talking to my husband. Because yes. something just triggered and I'm yes. back there and I'm, why? Why did this happen? There's no yes. justice. You know, all these years have passed. There's nothing I can do. And it's yes. frustrating. Yes. Absolutely. And the only thing we can do is, you know, like this, you know, bring out awareness yes. of things that people don't want to discuss. Nobody wants to discuss this because yes. they don't want to be called homophobic, yes. um, shut down as you're prejudiced, you're mean, you're awful, you're horrible. Yes. Um, and it's not that at no, all. Not it's at all. At all. And it's about having open eyes that see past yes. the BS. Absolutely. 100%. So, I mean, I get called homophobic, bigot, all sorts of things on social media. Um, but I've learned by now that, and I've done it, we've all done it, when you feel um, uh, that your identity or what your belief system that you thought was true is suddenly challenged, of course you're going to go into defense mode. You know, and my mom always used to say to me, when somebody starts name calling and being nasty and can't have a decent conversation, you know that you've hit a trigger. Yeah. You yeah. know that you've hit a trigger. And so the what I've done with this self-evaluation manual is um, I've included tons and tons and tons of academics. Now, one of the big prevalent um, uh, mental health issues within the LGBT community is something called Munchausen syndrome. It's not only in there, it's in the hetero community too, but Munchausen syndrome is people who fake illnesses or hurt themselves or fake a blood test and all sorts of things to get attention. And so- Or harm their children to get attention. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's Munchausen by proxy. So now what's, how it plays out in the LGBT community, for example, is they will overstate discrimination. I'm not saying discrimination doesn't happen, it does, but often they'll overstate it or they'll feel so hard done by when somebody disagrees with their narrative and then starts the cancel culture and the name calling. Now, those are all symptoms of Munchausen syndrome. And so in the self-evaluation self manual, I'm, I'm really going through quite a lot of things, talking about neuroprogramming, um, infant arousal patterns, um, so toxic self-reliance, toxic individualism, all of these different traits, narcissistic disorder, all of these things that are highly prevalent within the LGBT community and indicative of very, very toxic and mental health issues within the community that need to be, be addressed. And so um, I'm hoping that my autobiography and this um, self-evaluation manual will 
arm people with the right kind of knowledge from experience and this global network of people like me that come to know the truth, um, that they will be able to get honest and start having some real heart-to-heart -heart conversation instead of trying to cancel the whole world because you disagree with me. I had a guest on a few months back, Jeffrey McCall, yes. and um, I got a lot of uh, threats and things threatened to shut my you know, YouTube down and, and come to my house and hurt me and you know, all these things because I had him on my show and I had just I, like I had an agenda or so I just met him like an hour before we come on. We just yes. got talking on yes. Facebook. Sure. Because he had this, you know, like you, this yes. God experience that totally changed his life. And he yes. was a trans woman getting ready to go through surgery. Yes. And he threw out the wigs, the dresses, everything. And he changed his life. And now he goes and ministers all over. Yes. And, you know, they had him on Netflix and yes. um, made him look like the bad person. Yes. And so I, I, you know, the we are people are afraid to, like we say, and afraid to talk about this yeah. because they have that whole organization behind them that you feel yeah. like it's going to come at your door and say yeah. you did something immoral when yeah. that's not what we're doing. We're bringing yeah. out the truth, like you're saying, and you're sexually abused as a child. Yes, it creates these behaviors. Absolutely. That you were never meant to have. Absolutely. Someone Absolutely. perpetrated you and, and you're a victim. Yes. And you're yes. acting out this. Yes. They're not finding peace. I mean, maybe yes. some are, but for the ones that aren't, that are, you know, suicidal and the um the drug and alcohol addictions and yes. um issues and yes. um but, uh, the, I see a lot of anger, like you say, yes. when you just that's the most anger I ever see is someone that's in that community. And yes. it's like, wow, I, uh, this anger is, a, is like uncaged. Yes, absolutely. And so this is, you know what, this is the big thing for me is I'm, I'm not afraid of the LGBT community. And I often say to them, do you honestly think that your words can hurt me when my own boyfriend raped me? Now, I know that it's a hard line, but it's the truth. And so what I hope um, by speaking out, and because I've done quite a lot of reading, I'm not saying that I'm an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I've always been the kind of person that I don't just believe anything because somebody said it. I will go and read, I will go and try and find out information, I have discussions with people who know more than me before I come to a conclusion. And because of that, um, I've got quite a lot of information. And so I've it's ha to happen to me on social media, on, on Facebook, um, where international groups of gay activists come after me. And then uh, I just simply share every little bit of academic information that I have and use their own arguments against them. However, I just want to say this to the hetero community is don't be, don't be intimidated. When you think of the global stats, the estimated maximum amount of the um, global human community that identifies LGBT is less than 7%. And in fact, the LGBT community should be terrified because if they keep pushing this cancel culture, um, violence, intimidation, threats, well, well, they're very outnumbered. And so they should be very careful. And if they cannot learn to live with the fact that people are going to disagree with them and they are right to do so because the academics proves it, well, then they're in some trouble. Because you can only push people so far until that pendulum swings and you're going to get retaliation. But they have the media by the... <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, they that's get... why people like Jeffrey McCall and Freedom Movement in the USA and different organizations throughout the world I'm like people like myself who lived an openly gay lifestyle, did drag a few times, drags the whole the whole thing, and um, and having this amazing Jesus encounter and having multiple experiences, and they're all they're all in my book, and um, that have convinced me that not only is Jesus real, but that He loves us, and that and um, through this manual, uh, this book that I'm busy working on, that 
It will allow people to be able to climb off their pedestals of identity dysphoria because deceived people don't know they're deceived. And I'm hoping that with the multiple the amount of information in the book, that it will get people to actually humble themselves and go, okay, maybe I'm wrong. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person. Makes me a sinner like everybody else. Let me possibly explore this this Jesus and discover for myself if it's real. Because for <laughs> me, I can go from praying, asking Jesus to be my Lord and Savior to suddenly becoming a archangel with the halo. Not at all. I've been a Christian for 18 years, and it's taken me 13 and a half years and to give up sex, to choose celibacy, and not because I think I'm bad or anything, but because I've fallen in love with God so much that this little thing that I have to give up, it's a minor detail. Um, it took me, um, I've been, on the 18th of February next year, I'll be clean of drugs for six years. So that means of 12 of the 18 years being a Christian, I'm still relapsing, still failing. And so this is the, the message is that God doesn't hate you for being a sinner, no matter what the sin is. He says, come, let's work it out. Let's talk it out. Let me show you what love is. And that's what the LGBT community desperately needs is this love of this loving savior who sees past all the noise and the narratives and the hurt and that healing is possible if we just allow ourselves the privilege to try. I wish I could quote the Bible verse. It's something like, Angels in heaven rejoice more when one sinner repents than when a thousand righteous. righteous. Absolutely. That's exactly that. it. Yes, exactly that. So one of the, the very first Bible verse that I learned off my heart, um, my um, a friend and a mentor, the pastor in the UK, uh, Pastor Andy Barnard, he um, runs the church in Hingham in the UK. He brought me a CD back in the day when we were still listening to CDs. And it was the CD of a guy called Cy Rogers, who was one of the very first former trans men, or transitioning to become a woman, having a Jesus experience, who then stopped the trans surgery, eventually ended up married with a child, preaching across the world about Jesus. And he taught a verse in this CD set, which, which is Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6, which says this, Trust in the Lord your God with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Submit to him all of your ways, and he will make your path straight. And I can tell you that in the 18 years that I've been doing that, the one thing that I've promised myself, when I realized that Jesus was actually real and that he loves us, I made a commitment to never lie to him. And so if I was driving on the way to now go have a hookup sex or to the dealer, I would be crying my eyes out, asking him to please help me stop because I didn't know how to stop. And it's been years, but I'm now clean. I've now given up sex for four and a half years and walked away from the LGBT community. And there's still much that I still have to learn, but... If God can do it for me, he can do it for anyone. I mean, to give you an example, my imprinted arousal pattern stemming from my childhood sexual trauma, I ended up having sex with over 3,000 people in my life. And it was never because that's what I wanted to do. 99.9% .9 of that time, I always felt so dirty and like I had let myself down afterwards. And so when I went into sexual healing therapy at the age of 30 and started looking at why do I behave this way when my heart is actually monogamous? I just want one person for the rest of my life. I've always been like that. And so what we realized as we unpicked is, is what I was doing is my brain had fused the notion of love, intimacy, and sex as one thing. And so what I was doing is I was having sex with all these people thinking I'm showing you that I love you because I'm letting you have sex with my body. And if you love me, then I can love myself. And if I'm good at sex, 
then maybe you will love me the most and want to stay with me forever. And so when I realized that where that came from is because I didn't have a father protector, my father was an aggressor, what I was doing is that these people that I was dating, and I was always dating slightly older, I was projecting this imagined scenario onto them, expecting them to be my savior. And when they didn't, I was left with the feelings of rape over and over and over and over again. And so through sexual healing therapy, I learned to look at how my brain identifies sex, what am I attracted to, what type of sex, why this, what was the symbolism. And as I started to break it down, I eventually got to the point of realizing, hold on, I'm allowed to be loved before I have sex with you. And then what followed that was, Actually, if you aren't going to love me the way I need to be loved or want to be loved, then actually I don't have to have sex. And that's how I got to the point of celibacy. And, and it's not to say that I'm going to live in celibacy forever. I mean, God might decide to bring me a wife. I mean, I don't know what the future holds. But I know that through working it and bringing my issues to God, honestly, submitting to him, that Little bit by little bit, he healed the wounds that were so deep inside of me, you know. Um, and exactly like you're saying, and I mean, I tried to commit suicide five times. And that was, I mean, that in itself was an amazing thing because I never told anybody that I was going to commit suicide. I didn't let on, I didn't do a big song and dance about the fact that I was trying to commit suicide. I just did, went off, bought the pills, did whatever I was going to do. And every single one of those five times, exactly at the right moment, somebody walked in and they all said to me, it's like something just said to them, go find Arian now. And they did. And that was God. And so my story isn't unique. This is the travesty, is that my story within the LGBT community is not unique. And so I hope that both through my autobiography and the self-evaluation manual that I'm working on, that it will be able to equip all of us in the world to be able to reach out to this community and love them into wholeness so that they can try and find out what authentic love actually is versus this very toxic culture that's demonizing the whole world, but is actually just pointing to how much they actually hate themselves. At least offer an alternative. If you don't want to be gay, here yes. is this alternative. You know, here is this program. Here is this yes. council. There has to be something for the Absolutely. ones off of this. Yes. Want out of this. There has to be a community that will embrace them, that understands, not a Christian community that's going to judge them and yes. exclude them from everything because. Yes they don't trust these kind of people and yes. the whole time i watched bohemian rhapsody about freddie yes. mercury all yes. i could think of was what happened to him in that boys school when he was a yes. child yes that's all i could think absolutely absolutely i mean the same with elton john i mean elton john his movie about his life was exactly the same you know and and uh, if you watch the autobiography movies autobiographical movies of all these gay people who reached fame and wealth, their stories are all the same, all the same. The same with the lesbian community. It's all the same story. And this is one of the problems is, is that if a parent um, allows their child to believe a certain narrative other than the one that God made them, you're a man, you're a boy, or you're a girl, the parents actually then are complicit in child abuse because you're the one that's actually building mental trauma into your child or the parent who doesn't address a child who comes to them and says this person touched me in the wrong way and go for healing becomes complicit in the uh, the harm that that person causes on their life going forward and i you know what um for me i'm one of the very lucky ones in that I got to the age of 25 and I realized there's something wrong. If a boy, a man at the 
age of 25 is already trying to commit suicide two or three times. It's not normal. Why? Why do I want to end my life? And that started the journey of secular therapy, doing all sorts of things, Reiki, past life regression, inner child workshops, philosophies, Jungian philosophy, anything I could try to find to find answers on getting into Buddhism, getting into New Ageism, crystal healing, all sorts of things to try and find help to not kill myself. And that is how I ended up eventually getting into rehab at the age of 30 and then becoming a reborn Christian and having this incredible God encounter. And over the 18 years, like I said, it's just been this mind-blowing experience of realizing that Jesus is actually real and that he actually loves us. I wrote about um, sexual abuse in my family in my book. And afterwards, I had two cousins come, one from my mom's side and one from my dad's side at different times, and tell me things I didn't know. Yes. That how much this sexual abuse wasn't just me. It wasn't just this that I knew about how my dad and his brothers yes. sexually abused their kids and then their kids sexually abused their kids. And I know yes. my brother sexually abused my cousin. Now he's a gay priest in California and he's a very angry person. Yes. And, and he had told me about at my grandma's funeral, he told me about the sexual abuse by my brothers. Yes. And it, I just see all this hurt and <clears throat> My heart breaks when I watch these YouTubes or these people who went through the surgery and wow. to change their genitals and they regret it yes. and they have to live with this and they yes. do find another life. And you, some of them do, and then they do find happiness, but they do realize no matter what they did, they weren't getting what they wanted. Even they thought, okay, if I have the surgery, then I yes. will be happy. And yes. they're not happy. Absolutely. I mean, that's a fact. I mean, that's why the global stats show that even after trans surgery, um, over 85% of trans people repeatedly have suicidation thought, uh, suicidal thoughts or actually repeatedly try to commit suicide. Um, the LGBT activism through, through the media and social media likes to say because it's discrimination. That's not true. Um, the, the larger portion of that is this, is, is that you can superficially change what you look like. However, your mental health remains the same. Now, there's an amazing study um, done by Harvard University. Um, so what they did a number of years ago was they got a whole lot of dead trans people and they did autopsies on their brains. And they wanted to examine if it's true that somebody could be born with a different birth sex and brain sex. And so in the human brain, there's a, a thing called BSTC. It's words like this, BSTC. Now in a man, it's slightly bigger than in a female. That BSTC is responsible for your sexual hormones, your sexual drive, all of that kind of stuff. What they discovered with these trans people is that the BSTC had been altered, however, Every single one of those trans people had all been on hormone replacement therapy. So the truth is this, there is absolutely no scientific evidence whatsoever that somebody be, can be born with a different genital sex to their brain sex. It does not exist. And so what the LGBT community does is that they tell you the part of the study that oh, Harvard did this, this thing and the BSTC had been altered. That's where they end. They don't tell you the rest of the story that the hormones had already altered the people's brains for years of hormone therapy. The other fact is this, is, is that um, there are other aspects of um, male and female differences that the trans community don't talk about. Is Male bone density is heavier than female bone density. Um, per um, height and um, body weight category in, in men and women, the bone density is heavier. Men's lung capacity is bigger. Our muscle density is slightly bigger. And so our skin is slightly thicker. Stuff like that. So those are all physiological differences between men and women that the trans community completely didn't ignore. Um, and so 
that is the travesty of the LGBT community. And a large portion of that misinformation comes from an organization called GLAD, G-L-A-A-D. And the, if one Googles GLAD, it's fascinating. On their opening page on their website, they will say to advance um, the LGBT community and change the narrative through entertainment, social media, and um, and uh, schooling or political. political. That is their agenda. That is why you are seeing so many movies, so many social media things, so many this indoctrination onto kids, because that's the agenda. And so what the LGBT community does, they only share part truths, but if one goes and actually reads the studies that they love to quote, and you do the full read yourself, you will see, hold on, you're actually doing what Hitler did in, in Nazi Germany, is telling a portion of the truth, but you're leaving out, disguising it with lies. Yes. Yeah, it is it's lies. Just like the headlines of, you know, man has baby. Absolutely. You know, they did not. They had their breasts removed. They got yes. their hair cut short. They're yes. with a woman. And yes. they're not a man. They're a Absolutely. woman. Absolutely. Absolutely. A man doesn't have a womb. Yes. They don't have a uterus. They have nothing to produce a child. But the headline yes. is just a lie. Absolutely. So here's another technical fact. Is um, So my friend, Pastor Andy, who um, he facilitated me being able to get my Bachelor of Theology, which I studied through an American university called Nation to Nation, Christian University. And in the studies, one of the subjects was about the female reproductive system, because if um, we get sent to become a missionary in Africa or India or in places where they don't have good medical care, we need to kind of have some information about how a female body works, that if there's an issue that we might be able to find a solution. What is fascinating is this, is, is that the female um, body has two hormones that the male body does not have at all that are designed to um, stimulate her uterus her ovaries all of that kind of stuff that don't exist in men and so for a person who believes that they're a woman the simplest answer here is to discover if they have those two hormones in their body which they won't have because you don't have a uterus and you go well there we go you're not a woman. Men can't make milk. Absolutely. 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 Bottom line. Bottom line. And so I know that it sounds like I'm, I'm quite hardcore, but I'm really not. It's just I'm a reader. It's I love I'm, I love information. And the truth is this, is that I'm I, sure, I get quite emotional. I wish that I had the power to be able to convince, not even convince, to be able to have a rational conversation with the LGBT community because I love them so much. The idea that um, that at the end when Jesus returns, that this amazing group of people show who are so talented and so loving and so caring because some media, some activist, some liar told them that this is okay when it's not okay and the academics proves it, that they don't get a chance to be able to go for healing and therapy and re-evaluate. That, for me, is the most disgusting human rights atrocity that any activist group can push down the throats of the world that we live in and this amazing bunch of people. Yeah. And, you know, my cousin, this gay, he was like a little brother to me, him and his little brother, because I was the youngest of five kids. And so my little cousins, I got to be the big sister, you know, and so yeah. I got to be, you know, feel big sister of them. And I remember as a child finding out my brothers did something to that one cousin and I was devastated yeah. and I'm yeah. still devastated. And I carry guilt because I feel like I was their big sister, even though I wasn't. I felt like I should have protected them. I should have told more about what they were doing to other children and to other people and what they had tried to do to me. And, and if I had spoke out more, you know, and, and, all, you know, those things that they, that um, 
my grandma would have known to keep them away from my young cousin and um and to see his life now and just how angry and um explosive he is and you know he's he's all into the the community and i say he's a priest of some kind but um you know i never understood as as a as a young adult that he was a missionary like for christ and and doing all these wonderful things but yet he worked at a gay bar and that he was gay. And so I really like, I don't understand the, the Christian and how you can be gay. And like yeah. I was just a young adult trying to understand. And yeah. so, because, you know, I grow up, you know, my, my grandma would roll over her grave if she yeah. knew, that, you know, my yes. cousin did those things. Yes. Well, the reality is this, is that um, the truth is, is that um, the Bible is very clear about um, sexual sin, right from Old Testament um, in Leviticus, right through to New Testament, um, and even Jesus. There's a scripture in, in Matthew where the religious people of the day are trying to catch him out and talk about divorce. And in the Jewish culture of that day, if a woman married a man and didn't bear him children and that man died, the brother had to marry the wife. And so they're asking this question, if this family has seven brothers and each of them die and she doesn't have any children. Whose wife is she in heaven? And Jesus says that there is no marriage in heaven. So he catches them out of their own game. But following that story, he talks about um, eunuchs and, and people who need to give up sex for, to follow him. Now, what's interesting about that is, is that in the culture of the day, um, gay men were often frustrated and then put into um, the woman's uh, domain to protect them. And so when Jesus is actually talking about eunuchs and what he says is that um, some people will be born eunuchs, you know, people who have sexual issues, some people who are made eunuchs who are castrated, and then those who um, will be choose to be eunuchs for the sake of the gospel. And so in that Jesus is actually making a way for people who have same-sex attraction and saying to them, you don't have to necessarily become heterosexual. If that unfolds in your life, wonderful. However, he gives us the power to be able to choose to walk away from sexual identity and experience this one-on-one -on -one love relationship with him. And so the... The point that I'm trying to make is, is that the Bible's very clear about sexual sin, whether it be homosexual, heterosexual, pedophilia, bestiality, whatever it is. And so, but all sin is sin. All sin is sin. And that God doesn't discriminate against sinners. He says everybody is welcome. And trust me, I had to learn to forgive the pedophile who sexually abused me as a child, who raped me at the age of 12. And had to consciously work through a process of learning to forgive them to get to the point of where I'm now that I don't think it's right that pedophiles be um, castrated or put into bed, yes, put into jail, but definitely put into rehabilitation therapy to be able to try and undo the damage that caused them to become that way. You know, everybody deserves a chance at rehabilitation. And so this very toxic LGBT community who pushes this lie of this orientation that minimizes the people, a group of people's ability to experience real joy, peace, love, to give up addiction, to give up toxic behaviors. I think it's, it's so cruel. Cool. And if I, honestly, if I was a president of a country, I would make sure that the first place I start was to remove all LGBT as, um, activist groups in schools, in politics, everywhere. Force them underground if they must, if they want to continue, but to remove any access they have at indoctrinating this really beautiful group of people who need a chance to heal. Hence, hence this book. <laughs> and it's so strange too, because we're only sexual during our mating years, you know, as children, we're not. And as yeah. we get older, we're not. <laughs> Yeah. We're not sexual anymore. So, Absolutely. you know, all this hype on sex, like, yes. it's only 18 years, people. 
Well, we all become like we were when we were children, where it doesn't matter anymore. Absolutely. Can I tell you what's really amazing? Now, I know that I can't speak for everybody else and not everybody else is me. However, when I started um, on the journey of not needing sex anymore, what I found fascinating was once I got to the two-year mark of not having sex, um, I noticed that my sex drive or the hormones weren't as frequent as when the beginning, when I decided to stop having sex. And I think the reason for that is this, is that we're, the world is operating on this hyper sex drive because it's in every movie, every music video, everybody's always talking about it, you know, it's magazines, everywhere we're being indoctrinated and groomed, sex, 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 that if you're not doing it, you think there's something wrong with you. But the reality is, is that when, if we each had to allow ourselves the privilege to take a break from engaging in sex in any shape or form, we would all then discover the difference between a natural operating sexual drive versus an indoctrinated groomed sexual drive. I've been married 25 years and I haven't had sex in 10 years. Well, this is it. And it's, that's the way it is. It's like, it's not, well, well, that's the point. You know what? This is the point is that, you know what? The, in life, there has to be a maturity where the one isn't governed by your emotions or your hormones and all of that, where you learn to become an adult and that you mature into wisdom. And that when one's walking in wisdom, that we start to value things more important, like relationship, like intimacy, like connectedness, respect, honor, valor, value. Yeah, there's other things to life. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, to give you a, to, to to give you a very scary um, um, study, so. Um, there's a page that I follow on social media uh, called Fight the New Drug. It's an anti-porn page. Um, it's not a Christian page. It's a secular page, and they've got academics and ex-porn stars and all sorts of people and all sorts of articles. But there was a study that was done, I think, either in the USA or the UK. I think it's the UK, but I'm not sure, where they took two groups of kids, age 8 or 9 to 12, and then 13 to 16, and then ask them, have you seen porn? Where did you see it? When? What was the first time? What porn did you watch? All of this stuff. The alarming thing is this. Every single one of those children from 8 or 9, right up until 16, had been exposed to porn, had seen violent porn, and every single one of those children admitted to wanting to try a rape because they had seen it in a movie. And that is sexual indoctrination. And this is why um, the LGBT community is driving this transgender identity, the sexual indoctrination agenda onto kids as young as five years old. And as far as I'm concerned, if I was in a position of power, any school, any politician, any ped uh, pediatrician, whatever, that would push that identity, I would have them instantly institutionalized for child abuse. I had a guest on recently, she had her near death experience during rape. And then as the video went on, she started opening up about how she's into this bondage mm. stuff. Mm. And, and later after the video, she come at me in a very angry way. So this is a very traumatized person. Yes. That, you know, I would love to see like what you're doing become more mainstream yes. to where people can go for help because yes. it seems like there's this big gap. Where do Absolutely. they go for help? Because they sure don't like the pray away. I yeah. mean, that's what the whole thing was yes. about was putting down the pray away that Jeffrey McCall yes. was on. Um, so where do they go yes. if they want to change? Because our counselors, I don't know, are they afraid to yeah. counsel? These yeah. individuals, because yeah. some organizations going to come down on them. Absolutely. So where do they go? Yeah. Well, you see, this is um, not that I think that I'm anybody special. Please, I'm 
But this is why I'm such a huge advocate and will take any opportunity to speak to anyone about all the information that I've learned. And for that very reason is, is that um, I lived the, that gay lifestyle. I know the level of abuse that I experienced, the, the theft of being drugged so people could have sex with my partner, partners cheating, being raped by my own partner, um, um, and weeks for the skin on my face to heal, and the, the leather sex, the promotion of chem sex, the rape culture, that, that I would be in conversations with people and they would openly say, I wouldn't mind being raped. I shared an entire website, an LGBTQ website the other day, where people write these fantasy rape stories, LGBTQ people writing their own fantasy rape stories on this website. Another website where they share their um, bestiality, sexual fantasies on an LGBTQ website, where they share pedophile fantasies. Where I mean, do yourself a favor if you don't believe me. Um, to the the objective of the LGBT community is not equality. It never has been. The LGBT agenda is conversion. And to prove that, if you have to go and Google how to convert a straight woman, you will find thousands upon thousands upon thousands of articles written by lesbians on how to seduce straight women and make them gay. Or if you type in how to seduce a straight man, you will find thousands upon thousands of articles written by gay men how to convert heterosexual people. So the agenda of the LGBT community is not equality. It is conversion. And as far as I'm concerned, not out of a place of hate, but out of a place of care for the children of our future, if I was in a position of power, I would eliminate any um, 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 outreach that the um, LGBT activist group has into any part of society whatsoever, with immediate effect. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm just having flashbacks of memories catching my brothers, lusty children, yeah. and the story. So my cousins told me what they saw, like them molesting children, and then it makes you wonder where those people are now and have they ever been able to talk about it? Did they end up gay? Did they end no. up suicidal? Yes. No. Well, I mean, psycholog psychologists will all prove or say this, is that any, any child that's been sexually abused or early sexualized through pornography, whatever it is, they, there's three things that happen to them. One, they become highly sexual, um, sexually promiscuous or they become um, same-sex attracted, or they become asexual altogether where they don't want to be touched out of fear. So those are the three consequences of early childhood sexualization. Any psychologist will tell you that. And um, by coming back to the Jeffrey McCall thing about the prayer way, Christians and churches are filled with people like the whole world. And so in an attempt by people who didn't understand how homosexuality work maybe part of it was driven by prejudice you know and um, there was this false doctrine that was kind of pushed around about that you could pray the gay demon away and it's and this is why i speak about these things is that you can't pray away something that is a mental health issue it's going to take serious counsel places where you can be vulnerable with um, mm -hmm. pastors or churches embracing a group of people and allowing them the safe space to be able to let out all of this pain so that Jesus can start to do this healing work of, of restoring lives. And that's the same for the said, We're putting it in the schools and saying they have to yeah. have the right to bring these, these materials in front of these children and say it's an no. option. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Absolutely not. And, uh, you know, I just want to say this is that if you have any LGBT people who put horrible comments onto your, um, onto your show, you just direct them straight to my social media and um, Facebook page. I will deal with them with the greatest of pleasure because on my phone and in my reading and my research, I've got so much 
information because I make the effort to read, I will gladly deal with them. Gladly. Gladly. They're, they're vicious people, and that's not healed people. Someone no, that comes at someone vicious for having an alternative view. I mean, isn't that what they all started this, that they have the right to have their alternative view? But yeah. we're not allowed to have an alternative view Absolutely. based on our own experiences. It's not Absolutely. based on we don't like these people. We think they're wrong. We think they're dirty. And then we're not even getting into, you know, the side effect of HIV. Absolutely. I mean, well, this is the thing. I mean, I, I live with HIV. And I um, was given HIV by somebody who lied about their status. I mean, that is another travesty within the gay community, the number of gay men who lie about their HIV status. Um, I mean, in the 80s, there was this phenomenon called um, bug chasing, where gay men were literally having unprotected sex to catch HIV, thinking that once I've got it, I can't be reinfected so that I can just have sex however I want, not knowing that there's multiple strains of HIV and that HIV research is now getting to the point where they're realizing because people aren't committed to taking ARVs and living healthy lives, that um, there are HIV um, resistant uh, strains, which means that the next generation of HIV, if they can't find ARVs to cure them, people are going to die because they're like we have people who become resistant to antibiotics or whatever. People are becoming resistant to ARVs because they're cross-infecting each other continuously with multiple strains. And that is a phenomenon that still exists today. I, I don't understand. I really don't. Because one of our adopted daughters is gay, but she's mother of five and married. Yeah. She doesn't want a relationship with a woman. She thinks that's gross. She just likes sexual activity with woman and her husband yeah. likes these threesomes and these kind of things. And so none of it is textbook. I mean, it's all yeah. over the yeah. place. Yes. Yes. Well, you see, the thing is this, is that, um, you know, we've all. So in psychology, um, the, there's something called the golden years, which is not to 13 years. That is when a child or a human being is the most responsive to the world around them. So they're continuously receiving data, sight, sound, smells, absorbing things. And so that creates a neurological imprinting in your mind. Um, and so unless all of us go and sit with the therapist and go and have a look at what were my golden years, what were the experiences? What can I remember about my parents? Where did my fears come from? What are, what are, what? And start to trace all of those things. Because then what follows the golden years is that when puberty hits, we start to format our identity based on the data that we have. Now, the problem with that is, is that if there's trauma or pain or negative um, data or wrong perception, part of our identity is going to be misinformed. And so a lot of deviance, a lot of the exploration that we have as human beings um, stems from some of the trauma that happens in those years that we then act out in various kinds of ways. And this is the amazing thing about building a relationship with Jesus is that Jesus openly invites everybody to come. He says, I did not come for the righteous, but I came for the sick which means everybody's welcome. And that as we walk this relationship out with them, bringing all of our pain, our behaviors, all of these things to him, we start to unlearn these in, this childhood imprinting and start to renew the way that we think about things and start to live these different life experiences, which happen to be more pure, more holy, more good. And this is the problem, is, is that we, we pour judgment on ourselves by engaging in dysfunction because what our brain is actually trying to draw our attention to is, is that I don't feel worthy enough to be treasured enough as God's queen, daughter, king's son, this child of God, this child of life. And here's a story. So in rehab, 
God asked me a question one day, um, and he said to me, what is love? And I didn't have an answer. Like, oh, uh, love is an emotion, love is birth, whatever, you know the answer. And he said to me, love can never think, say, or do anything that's unloved. Or oh, that isn't love. Because the minute it's unloved, it cannot be loved. So the question that followed that was is that if you and I, anyone, any of us, think, say, or do anything that's unloving to ourselves or the world at large in a healthy moral way, the question is, why do I hate myself that I want to sell myself short? And that's the journey that Jesus takes us on is takes us into those dark places where we, we hurt, we've done things that we're not proud of, that make us not love ourselves. And through the journey of him filling us with his, his unconditional love and wisdom and healing, that we start to grow into the people we should have been before the world got its hands on us and then grows us into his version of who we should have always been. It makes me think like, you know, people that have to feed themselves with alcohol, have to feed themselves with yeah. drugs, have to feed themselves with a lot of sex. It's yeah. like they're trying to fill this empty space. Absolutely. And nothing, Absolutely. even, you know, drug, you know, a food addiction, you know, nothing Absolutely. is going to take care of it. You got to keep doing something because yes. it's not ever going to be fixed. Absolutely. Until you mean, it's yes absolutely it's the same with munchausen syndrome is um so it's uh it's a an offshoot of victim mentality i mean there are some people who are addicted to self-victimization to the point that um there are people in the world who take on pseudo personalities of victimized people groups and develop this whole online victimized persona to get sympathy. And so this Munchausen syndrome trait that plays out in people where we self-victimize, where we hold on to the pity party or we make excuses for not trying to heal because the attention is what we're actually after. So I don't want to heal because if I heal, I'm not going to get the attention anymore. And so we've developed this entire toxic society of people who, because we feed each other the sympathy going, oh, it's going to be okay, as long as you're happy, uh, whatever, don't judge, all of that kind of stuff. We're keeping people weak instead of going to them and saying to them, listen, you know that there is help available. You can be bigger, stronger, better more healed, more joyful, more peaceful, if you're willing to do the work. Yeah. You know, and I didn't realize I had 60 foster kids, 60. You know, that's my oh. whole life. I was trying to heal kids. I was trying to fix kids. Yes. But there come a time when I realized I never fixed me. Yes. And I need help. Where do I get help? I helped everybody. Oh. Never yes. went to anybody for help. Whoa. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So that is another thing that we do is, um, so a lot of times, so how our brain works is, is that, so we've got these neurological pathways that have been built on data that has happened to us in our life. Our senses, experiences, what we learn at school, whatever. It's all stored there. Now, where there's negative data, what our brain does, because its job is to make us feel normal and alive, it uses that data and so what happens is then we start to project outwards that like you were saying helping everybody else around you because you want to feel like you're a good person because deep down the truth is you feel like i'm not a good person or i'm a bad person or whatever the story is so if i'm helping these people then actually i'm a good person and i'm worthy of love and like you say until we get to that point in our life where we go hold on I'm allowed to heal. I'm allowed to heal. And from that place, when we take that horrible, scary road of suffering through the trauma and working it out and letting God heal us, the amazing thing is, is that what follows that is 
our capacity to be able to love the world so much more than we were, than we did, is absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. And I think the only path to healing is truth. Because when you put in lies, you know, lies of addiction, this will help, or lies of sexual, or lies of any any kind, you're never going to face the truth and get to the bottom and the root and heal from the ground up. Absolutely. So like a classic example of this, of something similar that you've spoken about, because I grew up the way that I did, where my father literally tried to kill me, um, I really didn't like myself. And so when I'm... Um, started working, I was working in um, high um, income areas, but I didn't feel like I fitted in. So I had every credit card, every clothing account, everything you could imagine, consuming fashion to dress the part and hopefully that people would not look too deep in the fact that I actually hated myself. Playing this persona, being highly effeminate, highly dramatic, you know, this whole crazy character, hoping that if I sold the lie, they would love me. But the Smoke reality screen. was, exactly, the reality was, I was dying inside. I tried suicide. I was literally living in a way, trying to kill myself. And that it was only when I started to get serious about the fact that I'm allowed to be alive, I'm allowed to be um, well, I'm allowed to... And um, want the best for myself without arrogance and go on the healing journey. That it's amazing what happens when we open ourselves up to God and the people He brings into our lives, the experiences to teach us that the world is actually a liar. And it's very cool because if it can keep hurt people hurting, it knows that hurt people are going to continue hurting other people. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and that's where we want this to end is to stop yeah. the hurting, stop molesting, stop yeah. the lying and yeah. projecting that this is all wonderful lifestyle and everybody should do it because you are speaking the truth Absolutely. about that is not all wonderful. And maybe they just want that sense of community to be able to go in this parade and really feel like they're really standing up for something. Absolutely. You know, I think a lot of it starts with that. Yes. Well, I mean, oh, remember, no. there's, that, there's that old cliche that says um, the den of thieves, you know, um, and a band of brothers is um, um, a lot of people when you are living a line, you know it, whether to what degree you know it, the easiest way to drown out that voice inside of you that says it's not cool is you just drown it out with noise. And the best way is with other people. Simple. And that's what the community actually is. What's interesting is this, is that there's two um, organized, un- less spoken about groups within the LGBTQ umbrella that is actually the LGBTQ umbrella uh, agenda, even though lots of lesbian and gay people are only now starting to see that what I've been telling people for years is the truth. The one group is called MAPS, Minor Attractive People, and they are people who are trying to legalize sex with children, underage children. And then there's another group called zoophilia, which are people who are trying to legalize sex with animals. They both are being brought under the umbrella of the LGBT community. And that is actually the the the, the undercurrent um, drive, is to drive society to such a point where it becomes so debased that whether you're and transforming your body to look like a lizard so you can have sex with a dog or having sex with children or forcing children to have sex with animals. That's the agenda. That's the agenda. And the, the first time, go ahead. And the more and more that the hetero community doesn't stand up and uh, retaliate against the LGBT community, and I'm not talking about in violence, definitely not violence, right. not in hate but to resist and say no we are here for you to heal you to love you but not with our children no more and unless the hetero community actually does that and starts to band together well we're going to see more people who are going to be writing more books like i had to trying to warn the world of 
what happens when when pedophiles just run rampant and sure destroy children's lives right it's like they're trying to totally take away morality Absolutely. sexual morality christianity Absolutely. and the first time i ever heard of uh the kind of organizations was years ago when i was in college i heard about the man boy love brotherhood yes. have you heard of that um i've heard of something similar in south africa but tell me how that organization runs all i know it was a secret organization that was also in our government here in the united states and it had to do with men that thought they should be allowed to love boys ah. and the boys should be allowed to love the men and there yeah. were raids and there was prominent there were yeah. prominent people arrested and it seemed like it all went quiet i started finding out about it when i first learned to get on the internet and google things yeah. and i started researching it because i heard about yeah. this and i thought yeah. why is it more said and done about this yes. Well, I mean, to give you a, a classic example, so uh, Pornhub, um, and well, all porn sites, well, most porn sites annually will um, release their stats, their viewership stats annually. That's one of the most frequented um, porn categories within the LGBT community is twink porn, underage porn, um, pedophilia, is one of the most searched categories across the world. And that is a very clear indication of how toxic, how toxic the LGBT community is. And my honest advice, not because I hate LGBTQ people, I love them. I trust me, I love them. I want them to heal. I want them to know that you can be free of that lie. But my honest advice was would be to the hetero community, resist. If you have to fire school boards that want to educate people about LGBT identity, fire them. If they're in businesses and they're trying to push that identity, get rid of it. Whatever it takes to eliminate this toxic culture of pedophilia within the community, trying to hurt the next generation, it must be stopped. And in studies around the world, they've realized that 11 to 1, and um, Peter, uh, Peter Philic identified people to get 11 uh, LGBTQ identity, uh, identified pedophiles within the community versus one in the Hitler community. And that is, those are the way that stand. And, you know, people may think, well, this, I'm not gay, so this shouldn't affect me. But this is affecting us, our family, right now as yes. we speak, because our youngest adopted son is married, they have two little kids. And I see his wife online doing, it's an adult site. And I look there because someone sent me something that she was doing this. And I'm concerned about the kids being around this. And yes. so she's in this wig and, you know, this bondage stuff, the skimpy outfit. Yes. And she's doing this stuff for men. And I hear my little grandchildren, four and five in the background. No. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And she's ignoring them. And then my little grandson comes in and stands right behind, right beside her. She doesn't no. say, get out of the room. She doesn't no. do anything. And so I'm thinking, there are these men yes. watching her yes. getting aroused. And here is my grandson. What happens Absolutely. if these people come to the house and my grandchildren get hurt? Well, guess what? A couple months went by and it's exactly what happened. Yeah. my grandchildren were removed from home and the little girl had bruises and redness between her legs now yes. somebody did yes. something yes to the baby yes and yes. so is 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 um you know what does it have to do with homosexuality well there's a lot of that going on i come to find out yes. they were making these horns and this uh gay stuff it yes. rolls into that and then my yes. kids are in the house and somebody i don't know you know yeah. was it a female was it a male that hurt his child what happened to my grandson we don't know there was no marks or you know he has speech problems and she has delays and they can't talk and so yeah. when i start hearing about people wanting a right to have sex with children like this a fluid yeah 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 you've heard of that i just yeah. go through the roof 
Yes, no, absolutely. So do I. And this is why I'm very, very, very vocal on social media um, as an anti LGBT activist. Not, again, not because I hate the people. I, I love the people, absolutely love the people. But what the community stands for, 100%. 100%. I will be an advocate against them, telling every single story, every single bit of academic information that I can get my hands on to prove why the hetero community needs to resist that community, not in, not in hate or anger or violence, but in love, so that the people yeah. can heal, so that we can protect our children. There's an organization that's just come out now three months ago called Gays Against Groomers, so they are people in the LGBT community, they still identify as LGBT, um, who are speaking out against the LGBT community. And it's wonderful for me to be able to share some of their stuff because for years upon years upon years, when you're a lone voice, it's easy for people to target you and call you all terrible names and say things and death threats and all sorts of stuff. So we've got this one group called Gays Against Groomers which are speaking out against the community. And there's a second group called LGB. So they are lesbian, bisexual, gay people who have completely disassociated with the LGBT umbrella because of the level of pedophilia, bestiality, weird sexual dysfunction that is happening within the community. Awesome. If you're going to be gay, at least be a good person, at least care about children. Try not to Absolutely. continue the assault against them. Absolutely. Simple choice. I mean, so it's like, yes, a simple thing. Again, it's an argument against the trans community, but also the LGBT community is your frontal lobal cortex is only fully developed when you're 24, 25 years old. That area of your brain is concentrated on behavior. And so if you're forcing um, puberty blockers onto kids whose frontal lobal, uh, a frontal lobal cortex isn't even fully developed, you should be institutionalized for child abuse because the person isn't even fully developed to be able to make a choice about what they believe about their gender. Um, and so, again, it, it, it just comes back to this cycle of abuse, repeating abuse, repeating abuse, is that any person, whether LGBT or hetero, that isn't willing to put their life on the line to protect children, they need right. help. They need help. Yeah. 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 If the adults of the world can't protect children, we're all in trouble. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, gay, straight, whatever. Yes. I don't, does, you know, if we can't get together to say, hey, you do what you want. Leave the kids alone. Leave yeah. them out of it. Leave it out of the schools. Leave it out of Absolutely. all these other things. Just Absolutely. leave them out. But you, see, you know, like I'm a firm believer yeah. in leaving children out of adult problems. You know, there for a while, people were getting kids out of the schools and have them marching down the street to protest this and that. And I'm like, yeah. oh no, leave the kids yeah. alone. Yeah, one hundred. Leave them alone. 100%. Let the adults fight about the politics and about the issues and everything else. Just leave the kids, let them be kids. They only get this Absolutely. short period of time and let yeah. them be healthy as they can be to be as healthy as adults as they yeah. can be. And we should, I think we should all should be on the same page with that. 100%. 100%. Women and children. Women and children. You know, we all should be um, fighting to protect the, the women because they are the baby makers. You know, so we need to be protecting our women um, so that they feel safe enough to be able to want to bring children into the world. Because if I was a woman right now, I wouldn't want to be falling pregnant because this world is horrible. You know, and so the men of the world need to step up and start resisting this toxic behavior. We need to learn our, unlearn our trauma so that we become the kind of men that we should have always been to protect our women, to protect our children. To resist this onslaught of pure evil. I mean, in my, in my studies, I con am continuing my studies at a, um, a ministerial academy here in Johannesburg, South Africa, called Curious Ministers uh -huh. Academy. And uh, um, there was a, a, a quote in one of our lessons that came the other day, which said, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. 
And uh, if we are not going to, if we want to make the world a better place, exactly like you're saying, it's time that we actually start acting like adults, making sure that our children are protected and as unexposed to stuff as possible so that they can remain as innocent as possible to start protecting our children and pushing out the drugs, the, the sexual dysfunction, all of that away from our society and allowing people to place into churches and to healthy institutions where they can heal from trauma. And I think this is a very, very important time we're living in right now where these decisions are being made. Like, they're, are we going to cross this line or are we going to pull back? away from this line that's being crossed you know it's like we like the lane this line in the sand's been drawn and yes. people have to pay attention to that line right now Absolutely. and what decide are we going to let them bulldoze over and keep going forward with this or are we going to pull back the reins and say uh stop right here yes. we can't well, again, allow this well, absolutely and again i'm just going to say to the hetero community the, the estimated global population that identifies as LGBTQ is less than 7%. It's time that the 93% take back its democratic right to protect our children, to protect our women, and remove um, um, evil and dysfunctional behavior out of our society. It seems to me, like just outsider looking in, like they want to flip that 7% to 93. So they're going Absolutely. to infiltrate, you know, the media, the schools that, that, you know, the given the shaming, if you don't go along with everything they come up with, like, okay, you're pushing the envelope now, you got your rights, but you're yeah. pushing further, you know, the age fluid and like those other yes. things you're talking about, the bestiality and, and all these things and the man boy love brotherhood that's been yeah. around for a long time. And it's all been in secret. And it seems like yes. they're wanting it to be open and they're wanting to get yes. rid of Christianity because they don't want that judgment saying yeah. it's wrong based on Christian principles. Yes. Um, but when end of the day, the thing is, like you're saying, is the welfare of the children. Absolutely. You know what? My argument always to these very sort of extreme wokers, liberal, extreme liberals, whatever, is or even the very far alternate right, because um, I'm center, politically I'm center. And what I always say to people is this, is that it's easy to say that you don't have rights when you're living in countries, the Western civilization, which is founded on Christian principles, which ended um, uh, woman abuse, slavery, all these different things, founded on Christian principles. And you're measuring it against what? Because if you go to Africa, or to India, or to the Middle East, or to China, those people are oppressed. Their governments force the religion onto them. And women have no rights. Children are treated terribly. There's dictatorships in, in those various regions. So you are measuring your freedom that you are given to be allowed to express yourself, saying that you're being discriminated, but you're measuring it against what? If you're so unhappy in the Western world, go live in those oppressive dictatorships and then see how far you get. So start having respect for the fact that the very foundation that you're living in is built on Christian principles. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Christian principles, you know, I say I have tried to live my life Christian. Yeah. And what did that do to my life? Well, that made my life great. I've never been arrested. I've never been charged with anything. I've already even had a speed. I haven't had a speeding ticket this century. You know, I try to always tell the truth. I try to always do good. Not that I'm perfect, but I'm always trying. Yeah. If if I was one of the people that I could have been, like I got this bad attitude when I was a teenager, I could have yeah. continued on that path and to heck with everybody. I do what I yeah. want. I don't care about the rules. I'm going to break because my youngest adopted son, that's what he's doing. He turned 18 and it's just like that. He decided to heck with everybody. I'm going to break every rule. If it's wrong, I'm going to do it. If it's good, I'm not. He's on that. He's on that. And he's yep. going to continue on that until he ends up in prison or dead or something. Yes. And so, but we all know those people in our lives, they're just yes. doing everything wrong because it's wrong. It's cool right now. Yes, exactly. Well, I mean, 
One of the most amazing principles in the 12 steps of recovery, and if I ever was in a position of power, I'd make every single human on earth do a 12 steps of recovery program, um, and preferably a Christian one. But the one principle is, is that um, unless we face our recovery, the end result is always the same. Jails, institutions, or death. And this is what the world doesn't understand, is, is that you are free to make your choices. God gave us liberty. The part that we don't get to choose are the consequences. We can try and duck and dive them, but if any person needed an argument to understand what, a plausible reason to believe in God, the mere fact that we experience consequences, we don't know where they come from, how they come to us, but we all experience them, something else is sending them, which means God. And so the, the point is of this, is that um, if we want to have a better world and we look at the consequences that keep coming to us in our lives, it's a sure indicator what we need to change. Because if you want goodness, you've got to give good. And like you said, none of us will ever be perfect. We're all going to slip up. But there is a way that God takes us out of this mindset that is destruction consciousness and heals us. And before we know it, as time goes on, we crave goodness. We want best for other people and ourselves. We want purity. We want love and peace and harmony. We're willing to sacrifice part of our lives for the greater good. Whereas on this side, it's the self-glorified narcissistic disorder where it's all about me, myself, and I, and I just want instant gratification, and the world needs to revolve around me. Like, exactly who do you think you are? And you've heard God's voice. I've heard God's voice. Jerry McCall yeah, heard God's voice. It changes your life. I've had, you know, absolutely. over 200 guests, and they've heard God's voice. They've yes. heard things that we need to stop and consider that God Absolutely. is taking out the time and yes. speaking to us people of all across the board of life, perfect, yes. unperfect, and everything in between. And yes. he has something to say. And, and that's why I do this podcast. So people can come on. I want to hear what God said to you. I want to, oh. I want to see how it changed your life. Absolutely. I mean, here's a very funny one. So I have an amazing, but I've gotten to the point where I have an amazing relationship with God and to the point that sometimes when I do something silly, that I can almost feel him laughing in the heavens, the joy that bursts out of me. And so during the COVID period, um, I was cleaning because, you know, COVID lives on the surfaces for three days and I was worried because I'm HIV positive. I'm perfectly healthy, undetectable. But I still didn't want to risk it. And so cleaning and making sure everything was sanitized and alcohol was everywhere, you know, to clean up anything. And uh, I have this glass table, this glass table behind me. I don't know if you can see it. And uh, the building next door to me started doing some renovations. And I would clean this table and within half an hour, there'd be dust on this table. And the one day I was walking through my apartment going, oh, God, this dust is irritating me. And I just hear God say to me, well, thank God you don't live in a tent in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank God. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and <laughs> so I hear God's voice all the time. And he sometimes speaks to me through a line in a song. It's sometimes a line in a movie. It can be a conversation. It can be somebody on social media who alerts my attention to this amazing woman called Peggy Robinson doing this amazing show of which I can speak volumes because I was born with a perfect gifting that the first thing I saw happened at the age of three. My life, I don't know what it means to live a life that's not spiritual. And I'm not talking about incense and crystals and sage and praying, not that. But I have no frame of reference of a non-spiritual life. I was born with it. Everything that's ever happened to me has always had a spiritual significance, every detail of my life. And so yes. I want to honor you that. And I just want to say to you, as somebody who was born that way, I want to honor you for your bravery, for um, 
doing a show like this where you know that some people are going to say things because they don't understand or they're scared and Hollywood has made it all so terribly terrifying. And I honor you for the bravery that you do. And I want to tell you that as somebody who was born that way, keep doing it because I know that you're telling the truth. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful meeting you. And it's awesome that we're able to connect. I'm in Long Bottom, Ohio, and you're in South Africa. I mean, yes. that's amazing itself. Yeah, thank so, you so much. if it's okay with you, I'll leave up with your other video because there's a lot in there too. That yes. if people listen to the transcript, or I can take it down, it's up to you. No, but no, 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 Peggy, you can leave it. You can leave it. I'm okay. glad that we could re um, re interview and get into some things a little bit deeper because I was also pressurized for time. But if I'm allowed to close with the sure. shameless print of my book. Um, I really beg people to go and buy it. Um, it's available on Amazon. Um, I took many years to write it and get it copy edited and to really talk about some of these spiritual experiences that I've had, um, the healing process that God has taken me on, and really to try and alert people to the knock-on consequences of when pedophiles are allowed to run rampant and hurt children's lives and how much work it takes to be able to heal and just want to stay alive. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. much. It's nice you, meeting you. You too, stay in you touch, okay? a wonderful day. I will do. Thank you, Peggy. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.